Now, we were mentioning the Prime Minister's arrival in Tuvalu for the Pacific Islands Forum this week. And, look, the reception he's received there, warm, friendly and so on. But we know Pacific leaders are really at odds with Scott Morrison when it comes to what Australia is doing on climate change. They want Australia to do a whole lot more. Phasing out coal mining, coal-fired power, not about to happen any time soon. What about New Zealand? The other major player in the Pacific, where does Jacinda Ardern come down on all of this? Well, she spoke to reporters after arriving in Tuvalu a short time ago. Look, our uh, relationship with the Pacific is based on New Zealand's principles. And whenever we go into uh, a forum like this, where there are uh, a range of other leaders, we will take a principled position on behalf of New Zealand. So for us, that's about making sure that we are doing our bit domestically, and we're doing our bit to support our Pacific Island neighbours as they make the transition around climate change as well. Um, and so that's the basis on which we'll be engaging in this forum. Not taking too many sides, Jacinda Ardern in all of this, as I say, regardless of what the Pacific Islands Forum communique says at the end of this week, Australia's not about to suddenly end its reliance on coal-fired power or, indeed, coal exports to the rest of the world. This isn't the only issue, of course, climate change and coal mining on the agenda at the Pacific Islands Forum. There will, either formally or behind the scenes, be a fair bit of discussion about China's role in the region as well. Jonathan Pryke is the Director of the Pacific Islands Program at the Lowy Institute, and he joins me now. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. Good to, good to see you there. Let's start on the climate change uh, front. I mean, just give us a sense. It would seem fairly obvious to some, but how important is the issue of climate change to those Pacific leaders? Well, look, the Pacific Islands Forum leaders meeting being held in such a vulnerable country like Tuvalu, uh, it, it's very predictable that climate change is going to be front and centre. You know, Tuvalu is a country of 11,000 people on a tiny atoll in the middle of the Pacific Islands. It's high, the highest point of the country is four metres above sea level. You know, when a king tide hits, you know, you're basically wading around in water. So it's no surprise that climate change was going to be front and centre. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so credit to Scott Morrison for, for showing up all the same. He knew he was going to be the bad guy in the room here. And, uh, and so he's just going to have to take it on the chin this week because, as, as you were saying, uh, what the Pacific leaders want is not more money thrown into the region to help mitigate climate change, it's more domestic action in Australia to help reduce climate change in the first place. Yeah, look, indeed, and there's only so far he'll go uh, on that front, we know. Uh, look, I'm not sure if you saw the pictures of a couple of hours ago when he arrived there, uh, the, the kids and a few adults as well were literally in a wading pool to greet him to make a not very subtle message about the rising sea well, level uh, issue. But, I mean, exactly. Look, Tuvalu itself, I mean, has sea level rise happened there already? Are they, are they already noticing impacts of climate change? Well, you know, there's all sorts of different modelling that have been done about the, uh, the impact that climate change is going to have on Tuvalu. In fact, some studies have shown that landmass has actually grown in Tuvalu. But I think, you know, mm. before, this, before this country even goes underwater, it is going to become uninhabitable because of a number of other factors. Salination of the water right. table, so just running out of fresh water, uh, the fact that they won't be able to grow anything uh, in, in their soil, uh, you know, and then also the ever-growing prevalence of natural disasters and the severity of these natural disasters, all as a result of the modelling uh, of climate change, is going to make Tuvalu uninhabitable before, you know, it goes underwater. Now, I understand uh, why they'd want to put pressure on Australia. Uh, we're there, you know, our Prime Minister's come along to this uh, forum. But how much pressure is also applied to some of the biggest global emitters? China, uh, for example, it takes a great interest in the region as well. Does it cop blowback from Pacific leaders about what it's doing when it comes to emissions? Yeah, look, China actually gets a, a free pass at the Pacific Islands Forum. The forum is, uh, com is 18 countries in the Pacific, uh, a membership, member of eight, membership of 18 countries, w including Australia and New Zealand. China is not a member of the Pacific Islands Forum. And so for that reason, it gets a bit of a pass. But the forum is also a consensus-driven uh, organisation. And the Ch China really divides the Pacific because half of the Pacific support China, half the Pacific support Taiwan. So the forum really doesn't want to go anywhere near uh, talking about China and talking about Taiwan. They want to talk about consensus, things that can bring the region together. So China gets a real free pass here. You know, they are a major emitter. Uh, and whilst they may have a, a better story to tell than Australia on, their, on how they're doing, what they're doing domestically, uh, their emissions are still going up and, you know, they, they need to take responsibility for this issue as well. Now, let's talk about China. They may want to uh, skirt around it in the consensus model that they have, but we can, we can talk about it. Tell me more about half the Pacific backing China, half 
Taiwan. Um, which half is which and why? What's the historical reason? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, historical legacy here. Um, there was a lot... So, stepping back, Taiwan has 19 remaining diplomatic allies across the world. Six of them are now in the Pacific Islands region. So this is a very important part of the world for Taiwan and its uh, legitimacy internationally. Uh, and, you know, that, and that includes Tuvalu, where the Pacific Islands Forum is being hosted this year. The other supporters uh, of, of Taiwan are Nauru, uh, uh, Palau, Marshall Islands, Solomon Islands... And Kiribati. Many, most of these countries are very small, uh, ex on, with the exception of Solomon Islands. And this is, you know, in the past, there was a lot of briefcase diplomacy happening in the Pacific, so showing up with cash to buy these allegiances. There was a moratorium put on that in 2006 as a result of elections in Taiwan. That moratorium has been lifted about two years ago with elections changing uh, the leadership in Taiwan again to a, a more hawkish government on China. And so in the last two years, we've seen four countries across the world that have been picked off from Taiwan and now support China. So this is a real hot issue now in the Pacific. The Solomon Islands, this became an election issue in, in Solomon Islands, and, it is, and they are still fiercely debating whether or not they should swap allegiances. And the briefcase diplomacy looks to be coming back uh, behind it as well. So, it's a, yeah, it's a very hot issue. And, and, and the four you mentioned there that have been picked off, is it clear that they have been picked off as a result of Chinese investment or debt diplomacy, as it's called? Is there an obvious link? Well, look, every country that around in other parts of the world, it's, uh, it follows a particular uh, playbook. You know, there's a, a, an announcement by the country that they're swapping allegiances, and then soon after there is a major economic package uh, or incentive to, for them to swap. So, you know, Tuvalu does... In, uh, sorry, Taiwan invests heavily in its relationships in the Pacific through aid, through diplomatic relations through people-to-people -people connections. And, you know, you'd expect, you wouldn't expect these countries to swap unless they had a guarantee to get at least as much, if not more, from mainland China. Now, PNG, uh, in the last week or two, we've heard about its efforts to refinance its national debt, which is nearly $12 billion. China is clearly an option for PNG. Uh, Scott Morrison made some comments the other day indicating it's not an option he would necessarily favour to have China re, uh, holding PNG's debt. Um, what do you think is likely to happen here? Is PNG just shopping around for the best deal it can find? Well, yeah, I mean, P Papua New Guinea, the economy there is very fragile and their debt is very expensive. It now makes up close to 15% of government expenditure just servicing this debt year on <laughs> year. In Australia, our servicing our debt is about 3.5% to 4% of government expenditure. So it's very expensive and it would make a lot of sense for PNG to restructure this debt. Australia, our preference would be for them to go to the IMF, which is, this is the International Monetary Fund. This is their mandate to help restructure finance in countries like PNG. But uh, the IMF might ask for uh, concessions from the PNG government, reforms that would be pretty unpalatable for the Marape government. And maybe they think they might, get, they, uh, might not be to get as many demands from China. So they're going around and asking you know, China to see what kind of deal they can get. And I think it's quite pragmatic from, from the point of PNG, but uh, also it's not at all in Australia's interest for China to become the sole creditor of our nearest neighbour. Look, when, when it comes to what China is doing in the region and what Australia is doing with its Pacific step up, there's obviously a lot of infrastructure investment going on. How coordinated is it? I, I recall, uh, it might have been around last year's forum, there was talk about better coordinating all of this. You know, it, it, it might seem a far flung dream now, but having China and Australia and anyone else sit down and coordinate the spending. So it's going where it's needed. Is there any chance of that? Look, it's, mu it's easier said than done. It is incredibly hard. You know, there are up to 62 uh, different donors operating in the Pacific. And, you know, back to what we were talking wow. about before, many of these countries are, sm are very small. You know, Kiribati, they deal with over 40 different development partners. Their economic team that manages their budget and relationships with development partners is a total of 12 people. So, you know, just imagine the, uh, the burden of dealing with all these different donors on the, on the government of Kiribati. So, coordination is critical. Uh, the, all the traditional donors, you know, Australia, New Zealand, the US, uh, the ADB, World Bank, uh, we, we do a pretty decent job of it, but uh, it's very hard to draw China into the discussion because we operate in such distinct, such different ways, but, uh, you know, coordination is going to be absolutely critical to make sure that we aren't stepping on each other's toes and we don't get a lot of uh, white elephants and failed infrastructure in the future. 
Yeah, that would require us to be talking to China a lot more than we seem to be right now. But anyway, Jonathan Broke from the uh, Pacific Islands Program at the Lowy Institute, good to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks for setting the scene for us.